Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this great Thursday you know, morning. Um, I just really appreciate you taking time to be here, uh, whether you're watching on Facebook um, or, as I learned yesterday, watching on YouTube. You know, we got uh, a lot of people watching on YouTube. And so thanks for, you know, being a part of what God's doing, especially if you're trying to just go through the Bible, trying to understand what is the Bible meaning? What is the Bible saying? And as you know, um, what I'm trying to do is we're just trying to do this in a very authentic and transparent way. So that's why it's live. It's not polished. It's it's just something that, we're, that uh, I would just say, you know, walk you through as we walk through this together and then seek the Lord, you know, in what that means for us. You know, one of the things that, uh, you know, I want to always remind us is uh, this phrase is going to sound funny at first, but you're going to hear me say this probably quite a bit over the course of the next year. Uh, the Bible, you know, uh, nothing in the Bible was written to you, but everything in the Bible is written for you. Let me say that again. Nothing in the Bible was written to you, but everything in the Bible is written for you. In other words, when this is being penned, like we're in Genesis, Moses is writing this down for the nation of Israel. He's writing it to the people of Israel, but it's for us as well. The Apostle Paul writes all of his New Testament letters, you know, to these churches that are to be read in the region. It's written to these churches, but it's for anybody who's going to be reading afterwards. Does that make sense? Which is why it's important to understand context. It's important to understand some background uh, in order to understand who the author is, where they're writing from, who they're writing to, and what the meaning might be behind to better understand what it is they're trying to say so that we can see how this applies to us you know, for us, you know, since it's not written to us. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, we got a long section today. We're in Genesis chapter 24, you know, where um, Isaac, you know, gets to have a wife. Now, um, I don't know about you, but uh, at this age and stage, uh, I'm starting to believe in arranged marriages. You know, um, <laughs> I wouldn't want that for me, you know, but as a parent, you know, as I start looking around being like, hmm, I think I might know best you know, for my kids, don't let them see this, by the way. And you might see, figure out the same thing as well. Now, you know, I'm only partially joking, you know, in this, because we're going to see how this has taken place. When we look at another culture, we might see, man, this is just feels weird. And, you know, the woman doesn't have any rights and all that kind of stuff. In fact, you know, that's actually not true. And well, we're going to kind of walk through this together. So let's start with this verse, uh, uh, Genesis 24, verse one, Abraham was now very old man, Remember his wife, you know, Sarah died. That was last chapter, you know, and the Lord blessed him in every way. Remember what God said. He fulfilled his promise. You know, he says, Abram, Abram, who becomes Abraham, I will bless you and make your name great. You know, um, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And so he has been blessed by God in so many ways, shapes, and forms. Doesn't mean things haven't been hard. Doesn't mean things have been easy all the time. And we've already gone through many of that as well. But one day, Abraham said to his oldest servant, the man in charge of his household, take an oath by putting your hand under my thigh. Now, ew, that sounds a little bit awkward, a little weird, but it just shows the importance and the significance, you know, of the covenant that God has made with the people of Israel when it comes to circumcision. And so he's saying, look, this is uh, an agreement that you're pledging. And if you don't follow through with this, then God is going to be your judge in this. That's how serious it is. There's no contractual agreements. There's no, yes, I'm going to do it. This was their way of saying you are bound by this agreement if you take on this responsibility. Okay, then it says this. Swear by the Lord, the Lord God of heaven and earth, that you will not allow my son to marry one of these local Canaanite women. Go instead to my homeland, to my relatives, and find a wife there for my son Isaac. And so he doesn't want this intermarriage, you know, with different peoples, especially when they might be believing in different gods. And so he's trying to honor what God has kind of led. And so instead of sending Isaac to go find somebody, he sends his servant. Okay. The servant asks, but what if I can't find a young woman who's willing to travel so far from home? Should I then take Isaac there to live among your relatives in the land that you came from? Because obviously Abraham is having this conversation, not thinking he's going to last that much longer. No, Abraham responded, be careful never to take my son there. For the Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and my native land, solemnly promised to give this land to my descendants. He will send his angel ahead of you, and he will see to it you find a wife there for my son. If she's unwilling to come back with you, then you are to free for, you are free from this oath of mine, but under no circumstance you to take my son there. Um, the reason he thinks that he may not be around by the conclusion of this journey is because the direct line distance from where they're at to Nahor or Ur, the land of Ur, you know, is uh, about 500 miles. 
but the path to get there is not easy, so it would take 900 miles for the average person to actually get there and back. Now, imagine how long it's going to take by foot or even by camel, because we know they're going to ride by camel, which you know we're about to read in a second, and you can see how long this journey is actually going to take. So the servant took an oath by putting his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham. He swore to follow Abraham's instructions. Then he loaded 10 of Abraham's camels, which if you go to Israel today, camels are everywhere uh, because especially in the southern part of Israel, very dry and desolate area, and camels are the best animal in that kind of terrain. Then he loaded all these, these, these uh, uh, and then he brought expensive gifts from his master and he traveled to distant, you know, Aram Naharim. There he went to the town of Abraham's brother Nahor. You know, uh, uh, Abraham's brother Nahor had settled there. He made the camels kneel beside a well just outside the town. It was evening and the women were coming out to draw water. So what was customary is in the morning, the gals would come out and they would gather the water they would need for the day. And then early evening before it got dark, they would gather the water they would need for the evening that would lead them to the morning. So this was a customary thing that would take place. Oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, please give me success today and show unfailing love to my master Abraham. See, I am standing here beside the spring and the young women of the town are coming out to draw water. This is my request. I will ask one of them, please give me a drink from your jug. If she says, yes, have a drink and I will water your camels too, let her be the one that you've selected as Isaac's wife. This is how I will know that you have shown unfeeling love to my master. Now, here's what I love about the way God answers this prayer, because a lot of times, you know, I'm thinking, God has taken so long to answer prayer. I mean, he could be there for days, you know, for this person to show up. But before he had finished praying, he saw a young woman named Rebecca coming out with her water jug on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, who was the son of Abraham's brother, Nahor, and his wife, Milcah. Rebecca was very beautiful and old enough to be married, but she was still, uh, but she was still a virgin. She went down to the spring, filled her jug, and came up again. Running over to her, the, her, the servant said, "Please give me a little drink of water from your jug." "Yes, my lord," she answered. "Have a drink." And she quickly lowered her jug from her shoulders and gave him a drink. When she had given him a drink, she said, "I'll draw water for your camels too." until they have enough to drink. So she quickly emptied her jug into the watering trough and ran back to the well to draw water for all his camels. The servant watched her in silence, wondering whether or not the Lord had given him success in his mission. Then at last, when the camels had finished drinking, he took out the gold ring for her nose, right? Nose rings bay back in the day, and two large gold bracelets for her wrist. Now, let me back up. The reason this is so important for the servant to understand is that it reveals Rebecca's heart. For you to offer somebody, a guest or a stranger, is, is hospitality, it's politeness. Hey, may I have a drink? But for somebody to offer to water or give water to their animals, especially these camels, and we know how many there are, would have taken quite a while. Uh, many of you know that camels drink can drink up to 20 gallons per camel. So this would have been like an hour of service out of her time. Remember, she just come. Who knows how far it's been that she's coming to draw water and that she was willing for a stranger Talk about the character of Rebecca. That's absolutely amazing to me. So then he asked, whose daughter are you? And please tell me, would your, would your father have any room to put us up for the night? I'm the daughter of Bethuel. My grandparents are in Nahor and Milcal. Yes, we have plenty of straw and feed for the animals, uh, for the camels, and we have room for guests. He bowed low, worshiped, praised the Lord, my God of my master Abraham. The Lord has shown unfailing love and faithfulness to my master, for he has led me straight to my master's relatives. The young woman ran home to tell her family everything that happened. Now Rebecca had a brother named Laban who ran out to meet the man at the spring. He had seen the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrists and had heard Rebecca tell the man what the man had said. So he rushed out to the spring where the man was still standing beside his camels. Laban said to him, come and stay with us. You who are blessed by the Lord, why are you standing here outside the town when I have room all ready for you and a place prepared for the camel? So obviously he's very interested in this person because normally you're not giving out gold, you know, uh, to people that you meet on the, you know, in the watering hole. So the man went home with Laban and Laban unloaded the camels, gave him straw for their bedding, fed them and provided water for the man and the camel drivers to wash their feet. So that's again, another sign of hospitality. Then food was served, but Abraham's servant said, I don't want to eat until I've told you why I've come. All right, Laban said, tell us. So he recounts all the things that he was told, you know, by Abraham and all the things that just happened. And so then he gets down to verse 20, 49. So I'm skipping down there. So tell me, will you, will you or won't you show unfailing love and faithfulness to my master? 
please tell me yes or no, and then I'll know what to do next. Then Laban said, Bethuel, but replied, uh, the Lord has obviously brought you here, so there's nothing we can say. Here's Rebecca. Take her and go. Yes, let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has directed. So when Abraham's servant heard their answer, he bowed low to the ground, and he worshiped the Lord once again. Then he brought out silver and gold and jewelry and clothing and presented them to Rebekah. He also gave expensive presents to her brother and mother. Then they ate their meal and the servant, you know, and the men with them stayed there overnight. Now, here's what you need to understand. When it came to that culture, you could not marry someone else, even in an arranged marriage, unless you could prove you could afford to take care of her. Because she was not allowed to work for money. She would work in the home and provide for the family and provide kids and all that, all that comes with that work and that responsibility. And so in order for a father to, or a brother or a sibling to know that you really are going to care for this person, you actually had to demonstrate that. So that's why he shows, look at all these expensive things. Look at all these things that we have for Rebecca. She will be well taken care of. Okay, secondly is that as an, a, 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 a person, the value of a girl in a home was much greater than we actually make it out to be. Meaning she provided, what is she doing? Think about the things she's already, we've already seen her do. She's getting water for her family as one of her chores, one of her responsibilities every single day. And I, gar I guarantee you, she had other responsibilities. So she was a productive member of her family. She you know, provisioned, she probably took care of things, she probably cooked, she cleaned. There was many things that she did that she brought to the family. They were going to lose that as part of the family. So how were they going to recoup some of that, you know, that was lost? Well, one of the reasons that you give a price is not because you are buying this person, but you're taking care of what this family is losing when they lose out on this person's contribution to the family. It's not a buy and sell thing. It's more of a, this is the system that we've set up in order for the family that loses a child to actually be taken care of. So just something to be able to process there. So then he says, uh, let's see, when Abraham's servant heard their answer, but early next morning, Abraham said, send, Abraham's servant said, send me back to my master. But we want Rebecca to stay with us at least 10 days. Then she can go. Now, who knows what's going on here? Does he want more gifts? Does he want more of those things? But he said, don't delay. The Lord is my, you know, has made my mission successful. Now, send me back. Now, notice this. Verse 57. Well, we'll call Rebecca and ask what she thinks. So a lot of times, again, she's part of the process that's there. Oftentimes, especially if it's a loving family, they're not just selling people off. Say, what do you think? Is this something that you want for yourself as well? So I love that this is included in there because this happens oftentimes behind the scenes in most Jewish households, you know, um, as we even look at Joseph and Mary and all that that takes place there. So they called Rebecca. Are you willing to go with this man? And she replied, yes, I will go. Free choice, free will. So they said goodbye to Rebecca and sent her on away to Abraham's servant and his men. The women who had been Rebecca's childhood nurse went along with her. They gave her this blessing as she parted. So in other words, she's not going to be by herself with a strange servant in a strange land. She has to take a close friend. Remember those that uh, person who was her nurse probably was one of her closest friends in terms of growing up. They gave her this blessing as she parted. Oh, sister, may you become the mother of many millions. May your descendants be strong and conquer the cities of their enemies. What a cool, a cool opportunity and privilege and blessing. Rebecca, her servant girls, mounted the camels, followed the man. So Abraham's servant took Rebecca and went on his way. Meanwhile, Isaac, whose home was in the Negev, had returned from uh, Biar Lauriari. However you say that name, good luck. Uh, one evening, as he was walking and meditating in the fields, he looked up and saw the camels coming. Rebecca looked up and saw Isaac. She quickly dismounted from her camel. Who is that man walking through the fields to meet us? She asked the servant. And he replied, that is my master. So Rebecca covered her face with her veil. Then the servant told Isaac everything he had done, which was proper for them to do as a form of modesty and respect with what was about to take place. And Isaac brought Rebecca into his mother Sarah's tent, and she became his wife. And again, it didn't happen that same day. We're just the Bible just kind of moving along. He loved her deeply, and she was a special comfort to him after the death of his mother. What a cool, you know, story and experience. And my prayer and hope for us on this day, because I know we've gone long is that you and I would also trust God. They would say, God, if you're leading, allow me to be in your will and to be faithful with what you have presented before me, to know that God is faithful. 
as he leads, he will provide. We just need to take the steps, right? There's a part that we play. We don't just sit at home and pray. We actually pray and we move. Those are the two things that we see on a regular basis in the Old and New Testament. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for today, for the opportunity to learn once again of your provision, of your blessing, your guidance. Pray you would lead and guide us and help us to follow you all the days of our lives. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, have a great rest of your day today. And don't forget, tonight we got services once again, part two of Base Camp, as well as Sunday. Hope to see you on site, you know, as well as if you can't make it for one reason or another, I'll see you online. Have a great day.